Here is Dalton's Law, Part 2, um, Collecting Gas Over Water. The last one was a little bit, the last lesson was a little bit short on this part, so. <coughs> or short on time, I didn't want to try to squeeze it in there, so. Okay, this is an important application of Dalton's Law. And remember Dalton's Law, well, you just saw the video, right? Oh, I forgot to mention the homework. Um, you need to do number three and number four for the homework for that honors and AP. Now, for on um, general, you're only going to do number three and number four A. Okay, three. I did. It, I, held, I held my hand wrong. Three and four for the AP and honors, but for general chemistry, three and four A only. I only do part A or four, number four. I mean, if you watch the video on um on the other part, uh oh, what's happening there on the um. Mole fraction, then you can also do that if you wanted to. I'm trying to see if it, it is kind of moving around a little bit. Let's see if I can get it to be straight. Okay. All right, here we go. So this is an important lab technique about how do you cap how do you capture a gas? A lot of times we'll say, well, if you do an experiment, you mix two chemicals, you see them bubbling, how would you collect that gas? What's one way, way to do it? And one of the more common ways people will say is, okay, if I had it in here or something, I put in some chemicals, it started to bubble, how can I collect the gas? You might think, well, I'll put a balloon over the top of it. Well, that's one way you could do it. You have to kind of kind of be careful and um, a little strategic about how you can capture all of the gas. Wow, it's like, there we are, okay? Try not to move again. Um, but this is another way that can be done is um, you bubble it over water. And I have a little diagram here. Actually, I'll just show it. I'm gonna, I am gonna try and draw a little when I'm bored, though. But it's this one right here. You could actually draw onto this as I, as I make it. You get a label on it. Um, I'll draw a flask. Now this is just one way it can be done. So you put a stopper in the flask, and say you have some chemical in here, like maybe acid. You drop like a metal into it or something like that. All right, and so it starts to bubble. Bubble, 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 bubble. All, right, all these bubbles come up. So you know that's a gas. Well, then what you'll do is you'll have a glass tube. Usually there's a glass tube inserted through a stopper. And that is something you want to always be amazingly careful to do. I don't have one with me, but I was going to show you. If you ever push a glass tube through a through a, through a hole, there's like a little rubber, black rubber stopper. I, I don't know why I had some in here, but oh well. Um, anyway, when you put it through there, you want to make sure that you never push the glass, like just, just to get in there. Like you don't want to do this. Let me find a, a pen to use. Like you do, would never want to take this and just, if this were glass, you would never want to just like put it to a stopper and just say, oh, I'm going to push, that down, push it down in there. No way. The glass could break, boom, and suddenly that glass could just jam right into your hand. So they say that when you put it in there, you hold your fingers and you just kind of like push a little bit, a little bit at a time. You, you don't go real far back and push on the glass, but do it right in there. All right, whatever. Kind of goofy to show you that or tell you that. But anyway, um, just so you're safe about it. So that usually is something that we'll do anyway. So the glass tube usually looks like that. Then they put a rubber um, a rubber tubing over um, around the end, over the end of, the, of the, the glass, and it will come down. Now what they'll do is they will submerge. Well, I'm going to say a submerge, but... Yeah, I can almost do that. I've got some there. Oh, well. You've seen it. I think you've seen it at some point before. But if I fill water up, you know what? I actually have some water. I can actually do this. Okay. Let me just let me just show you. I'm going to put, I just noticed I have this in the room. And I think you've seen this before. Well, I'm not going to be able to put a, um, a tube in it. But I'll show this to you at least. You've seen this before anyway. Like I have a, a flask and I have a, um, a beaker and I'm just going to invert this like that. Now, notice, you see how the water in the flask in the top is it's, it's staying there. It's being held up actually by the air pressure hitting the surface of the liquid all around it. Now, um, I'll, there's some neat things I can show you in class with this as well, but you can see that this was inside it. Now, what you would do is before I invert it or whatever or after... A couple things got to be different. I have to completely fill this up all the way with water. To be safe, I would. 
Then what you would do is you would put a rubber tubing in there. Now, this would not be a good beaker to use. Or, I'm sorry, beaker. This beaker, you could, the flask, because you want something with calibrations to be able to tell how much gas you collected. This would actually be very good to use. In fact, maybe I'll do it over with that one. Oh, no. Oh, oh, okay. I'm not in the lab room. I'm in, in, a, in a room here. Let me see. Oh, well, if I spill on the floor, it's okay. This actually would be better. I didn't think about this one is better. So I put it upside down. Whoa. But now, notice this. Now you have some calibrations. So that's held up in there. So if I had a rubber tube inside there right now, I did it pretty good this time. It's completely full of water. Now I could take this off and you could you could see um, the other numbers below it. Oh, no, you can't. It only goes to about five. So once, if I let, oh, uh, there is some air in there, but oh well. But if I, I could actually read it before and after. Like, I, like say if I'm starting, like it's probably at about, it's probably just at about five, about five milliliters right now, the level in there. You can try to see the water. It's probably about five. But um, I could actually let more air in and start it at one of these lines. And then what you do, you bubble it through. So the, the bubbles are going to go through. They're going to go up through here, up, 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 up. And the, the water level here is going to go down, and the water level here, level here is going to go up. And, of course, the way I made it, it's so full it would overflow. When you do this in an experiment in our class, you'll not, you don't need to have that much water in there. I, I can't really play around with it much more, but you don't need that much water to be inside here because um, you, all you need is just to, for the very end of it to be submerged. It could be a really small amount of water. But then as you let more air inside, it's going to come down. So anyway, I'll get back to this. So this is one of the problems that um, maybe not for, it might not be true for AP, but for general it will be. When you read this problem, it'll be like one of the longest problems you've seen. Like, oh my gosh, what is this? But it's one of the easiest to solve. It just has a lot behind it, a lot of information that you need to, to watch out for. Looks like I'm still kind of slowly moving over the little camera there. Okay, so I'll just put this inside. Uh, um, I, I had it as a as a flask. You know what? I could actually make it as a. I could make it like a long tube. In fact, I forgot to tell you that. There's there's something called a gas collection, or gas collecting, or whatever tube, and it looks just like a long. Um, like a, maybe even if you remember what a burette is, but it looks like a long graduated cylinder, really really long. And it has a lot of lines on it, really long. I'm sorry. Let me even be better than that. It looks like a test tube, like this, except instead of being this long, it might be like a yard long or one foot long, and there'll be lines all over it. That's a gas collection tube, and we have some at Venice where we can use. And what you do is so you put the tube, the rubber tube comes down, and it goes into that. Well, that's one way to do it. Now, there's another way to do a lab like that. And this is immersed in water. So that now this will be underwater and this will be full of water up here. Okay, so that's a, another way to do it. Sorry about that. Gas collection tube. You know what? I'm going to actually go back to the drawing that you have on your paper. But a gas collecting tube looks like that and it's, it works out. But I'm going to draw the one you have on your paper because I need, you'll see why in a minute. I need to have some space to draw some things up there to let you know what's going on. So you can certainly take one of these, fill it with water, as I did at the very beginning, upside down, invert it. Now, what will happen is, this is full of water, we'll say, at the very top. Okay? And then here, the tube will go inside to there. Oh, what a, what a messy drawing that is. Okay. Well, there it is. That should be a rubber tube. Okay. So as the gas is built up here, you would do this, you would set it up, and then before you drop the metal in, then you, we have a lab like this for General Kim, and for AP, there's another version in honors. It's another one you would do. But, um, but what you do is you'll take this out. You drop it in real quick. You drop in the metal or the, the, um, the chips, and then you close it off. And right when you do that, you wait, and you'll start to see that you'll start to see bubbles come up. And as bubbles come up, the level here will go down, and the level outside of water will go up. So say you, you do this for about four or five minutes, all right, now you notice, wow, look, the water level has gone down there and it's gone up here, okay? Or we'll go on and on and on and on, and then finally until they're equal. Now, the only difference, when they're equal, you want to stop the experiment, okay? At that point, you can stop it. 
Now, what that, um, you also have to have, well, to be precise, you need to have some lines on this thing. If you didn't have any lines, then what you could do is you could mark it with uh, what would work in water. A crayon might, but um, there there's some things you could do with that. Or, or, a stri or hey, uh, even better, a rubber band. You could have a rubber band here, and you could just put the rubber band right to where that water level is, stretch it down, so you know exactly where it was. So when you take out the flask later, you'll know, like, okay, I had gas. I had that much gas inside it where that rubber band is. Then you can fill it up with water and measure it. That, that's one thing you could do. It's better just to use a tube that had the lines on it, a gas collection tube. Okay, I'm saying so much. Back to this. So when you get to, um, when the water level inside and outside are equal, then um, what that means is the pressure inside, the pressure of the gas inside is going to equal the pressure of the gas outside. Now, what is the gas outside? The air. Air is hitting all the surface. That was what hold, holds the water up before. Now the gas inside and the gas outside are equal. When the levels are equal, ATM, PATM, the atmospheric pressure or the barometric pressure equals the total pressure when the water levels are equal. Okay. Um, I think at that point now I'm ready to try to do a problem. Okay. So here we go. Um, collecting gas over water. You have the reaction flask, collection flask. Oh, if you read through this, you'll see exactly what I just told you. It, it explains the whole thing there, atmospheric pressure and so forth. Okay. Um, all right, and I'll tell you about vapor pressure in a minute. So, okay, here's how it goes. L um, question B. It says, I could probably just do it right here. Chlorine gas is collected over water at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Um, the vapor, VP of water is 23.77 torr at 25 Celsius. I'll tell you about that in a minute. A total of 80 milliliters of gas is collected. The water levels inside and outside the collecting bottle are equal at the end of the experiment. The atmospheric pressure is 765 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so calculate the partial pressure of the chlorine gas. Now, one thing about this problem that stands out, think about what we've done in this chapter. Think about a quiz coming up or a test coming up, and you're going to have, oh, this problem might be Dalton's, I mean, I'm sorry, this problem might be um, Charles' law or Boyle's law or the combined gas law. Or, but how, or Dalton, I, I did say Dalton, like, oh, it, the, um, there's a container with helium gas at pressure of five atmospheres. Oxygen gas at 12 atmospheres, so forth. So I might, I might give you three pressures, and then you say, oh, I add them up, okay? Well, if you see a problem that says um, collecting gas over water, immediately, here's what you should think in your mind. If you wanted to, you could memorize this new equation. PT is equal to PG um, plus P H2O. What does that mean? Okay. The total pressure inside the container will equal the pressure of the, of the um, gas collected. I'll put gas there. Instead. The gas collected plus, why am I putting H2O? Well, water, we only put gases here. Water doesn't have a pressure. We, we, well, we don't really, we don't consider water pressures in this. It's gas pressure. Well, here's what happens. When I first inverted it upside down, actually this, this is still inverted, uh-oh. When I first inverted it upside down, if water is all the way up here, to the top, if it were all the way to the top, then um, there would be no, no space above the water. If there's no space above the water, then there's no, it's empty, it's a vacuum. But as soon as you start to produce gas and push it down, something neat happens. Water evaporates, and you probably know this. Now, I'm going to spend a little bit more time explaining it, talking about this. Okay, so what happens is the molecules of H2O, they're all throughout the water, and they're joined together. They're attracted by what's called hydrogen bond, intermolecular forces. Anyway, they're all through here. Well, here's an interesting thing. The water molecules that are on the very top layer, at any temperature that you have liquid, it could be 
one degree Celsius, really cold, almost freezing, zero. One degree Celsius or all the way up to 100 degrees Celsius where it's boiling. Anywhere in between, if you ever have water with space above it, water molecules on the top will escape like this. Guess what? That's called evaporation. And you've heard of that before. So you don't have to boil water for it to evaporate from the surface. Now, boiling is when you see bubbles inside here and they're escaping from in here. And we're going to talk about that later on in Chapter 10. So we're only in Chapter 5 right now. So, okay. But evaporation means when water molecules escape from the surface and they fill up the area. Well, unless you're in a completely dry climate, there's always going to be some water vapor in the air. Always some amount of water vapor is in the air. Humidity. You've heard the word. That, that's what that is. Humidity. Well, okay, so what happens is there's a certain amount of, of um, H2O molecules that can, that can um, fill up the space above water at every given temperature. So um, that that's true. Now, obviously, if I have it at a higher temperature, if my temperature goes up, will I have more or less molecules? <coughs> and you'll have more, you know, because as you go to higher and higher temperature, you'll have more and more and more. Okay, well, those are gas particles, and they actually collide with each other, and they have a pressure. So we call that the vapor pressure. The vapor pressure of water would be the pressure that the molecules of gas have as they collide around. Okay, so anyway, back to this. The total pressure inside the tank, we said you're collecting chlorine gas, which is a, a yellowish gas, um, pale, kind of pale green yellow. I'm trying to see if I have a yellow piece of chalk down here. Here it is. So you'll get this yellowish gas. By the way, if you do a lab and you ever see this yellowish gas, you need to get out of there. Okay, move over. To get out. Get get out. Tell everybody we, this happened before in my class, and they're like. This yellow gas is coming out of his, oh no, we got to run back, okay, because it was producing chlorine gas. You'll notice a slight odor, it will be like, like around a pool, but it's a lot stronger if you see that color. And what you have to do is you have to get out of there, open the doors up, windows maybe, it'll, it'll dissipate and it'll be okay in the air, it'll get out, it'll escape, it won't be a problem, but you don't want to breathe that in. Um, you can also get a similar effect if you ever, if you're cleaning in, um, let's say if you're cleaning the bathroom and you use, um, at home, you, you use uh, bleach and ammonia. You never want to mix bleach and ammonia together. Just remember that, okay, because it can produce chlorine gas, which is dangerous as well. And it, again, if you happen, you know, a small amount and you you don't have like a really concentrated stuff that you use in your bathroom, but if you smell that, then like I said, put on, turn on the fan, exhaust fan, open the windows up and get back. You know, what's weird is you'll be in there cleaning and you don't even notice the smell of it. So you might, somebody else will come in and you're, you're like, wow, you, gosh, it's so strong in here. Do you notice that? And they don't know. They don't because they're used to it. They're in, whoever was in there. So just tell, you know, be careful. Be, be safe about that. Um, anyway, okay, so I'm getting one up the subject. So yellow gas, there it goes. It bubbles up. It'll collect in here. Well, it's not going to be just chlorine gas that you collect. But since there's open space, water molecules are also going to go up there. So now, the total pressure up here will be two things. The pressure of the chlorine gas as it, as it bumps around and the pressure of whatever water molecules evaporated, P of H2O. So, to do this problem, I'm, I'm I know I told you I'm going to explain a lot of steps, a long thing here. You get it detailed. When you, whenever you collect the gas over water, the total pressure inside this container will be the pressure of the gas you collected, in this case it was chlorine, plus the pressure of the water vapor at that temperature. Now, in the question, it tells you this. It says, VP of water, vapor pressure of water, equals 23.77 torr. So I'm going to plug that in right there. Now, for, you know, I'll, I keep saying for AP, but you know what? It could be for anybody. It could be for general chemistry. What they can do on a standardized test, on an AP exam, on the California state test, did you take at the end of the year in March or whatever, April, whatever it is, um, they could, instead of telling you the vapor pressure of water equals 23.77 at 25 degrees Celsius, they could give you a chart that says something like 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. They, they might even put 
21.5, 21.6, 21.7, 21.8 degrees Celsius. And then this side, they'll have the vapor pressure in tour, and they'll go all the way down. They'll, the, they'll have a chart for you. All I'm saying is they might not tell you. They might make you go look at a chart and say, oh, at 25, it is, oh, 23.77. Okay? So <clears throat> just to kind of be beware, be, be wary of that. <clears throat> There's no way to, to figure out the vapor pressure on your own. Well, not right now. Not, not at all in this class. No, not until you get into college. There'll be some stuff you can do. Okay, so we know the water's vapor pressure. We don't know chlorine, but we do know the total pressure because look what it says in the question. The water levels inside and outside the collecting bottle are equal at the end of the experiment. So since they're equal, remember that means the total pressure here equals the atmospheric pressure. Like in the video I showed you before with the manometer, when they're equal, it's a very similar concept. So these two are equal. Now whatever the air pressure is from the barometer in the room or from your phone, you, you probably know that your phones are touch sensitive and they, a lot of them have, they have uh, barometers in there now. You get a barometer app for free, it'll tell you the air pressure. But anyway, um, the pressure, total pressure, will equal the atmospheric pressure. All right, so when, when water levels are e equal, when water levels are equal, atmospheric pressure equals, well, I'll put total pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Okay, and atmospheric pressure is 765.0. Now, this one says millimeter of mercury. Now, the good news is, Maybe you know that millimeter of mercury and tor are the same thing. So you know what? You don't need to show me a conversion for that because they're exactly the same thing. Tor and tor, millimeter of mercury are the same. If it said atmosphere, then you would need to convert them to both have the same unit. Probably I would go with atmosphere, make them both an atmosphere if one is different. But um, it's okay since they're both tor, tor, that's fine. Um, now, the next thing you do is just what? Just subtract. So here it is. Plug in the numbers. Subtract 23.77 from each side. And what is that? 765 minus 23.77 is 741.23 millimeters of mercury. Up, oh, this chalk is about to have it. There it is right there. Okay, that's the pressure of the chlorine gas. Now, look at that. Look at how short and easy that was, and look at how long the problem is on the paper and how long it took me to go through all this. But I want you to get every detail about it. Okay, um, now it says this next part, what are the mole fractions for all the gases present? in the collecting flask after the reaction. I guess I'll do that part. That is, um, this is only for the advanced as well. So you could, otherwise you're done with the, the general, you can do number three and number four A, but then the other ones you, you probably recognize this from the other lesson. I don't even know if you need to hear this for the advanced, but I'll do it. Okay, what are the mole fractions? Okay, remember, so what are the gases inside there? It's just gonna be, Chlorine gas and water vapor. Oh, oh no, I just, I'm going to forget what the answer was. 765 minus 23.77, 741.23 equals chlorine. Oh, you know what? I better leave it there. You'll see why in a minute. Okay, so the mole fraction of chlorine gas would equal... The either remember it's either equal to the number of moles of chlorine over total moles, or it's also equal to the partial pressure of chlorine over the total total pressure. All right, so moles of chlorine. Uh, I'll use the pressure one. Okay, so the pressure of chlorine is seven forty one twenty point twenty three. And your total pressure, actually they even gave you that 765. So you don't even have to do that. Now, I would put the normally put the units in there, but they're both tor. I, I'm not going to worry, and you're gonna, they're going to cross out anyway. So 741.23 divided by 765. 
six. Huh. Am I really going to put five significant figures on this? Four here. Oh, I'm sorry. That only has four. So it's going to be four six figures. It's still a lot. Nine, six, eight, nine. That's the fra mole fraction of chlorine. And then for, for water, the other gas, you can either take um, 23.77 over 765, or you can just take 1 minus 0.9689. I guess another O can go there, which is 0 0.0311. One point zero three one one, yeah. So those two will add up and give you one overall. So there it is, right there. All right. So that is all, and there's going to be more for AP to do with this, even in the next lesson. You're going to come back to this problem. You'll see it return again, but that'll be good enough for right now. So see you guys later on. All right.